Okay. Yeah, the session is now recording and people are able. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we're going to wait just a couple more minutes for 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 people to join. Okay, so I think we can I think we can start. So welcome everyone to to this morning's um, community building session. We will be looking at a set of examples um, across the EOS Hub, Freya, and Shock projects. My name is Timea Bayro. I work for the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, I will be moderating this, uh, this session and hopefully I'll bring forward a couple of perspectives from a few of the activities that we, that we have been um, involved in, such as the RDA Europe um, Ambassadors Program and the RDA Communities Practice that are currently being set up. Before we get uh, before we get started, though, a couple of housekeeping uh, points. So the meeting is being is being recorded. Um, the recording and the presentations will be made available um, online. The organizers will be following up after the after the event with all the relevant links. Um, we kindly ask you to mute if you if you are not speaking, but please feel free to turn on your camera, um, especially during the um, during the discussion uh, panel. Uh, because it's always nice to see to see faces in the in the crowd. Um, we would like you to also um, use the chat function if you have uh, if you have any questions. We went for the we chose the meeting uh, format because we thought um, it would versus the, um, the webinar format because we thought that would help with the meeting being a little bit more, more interactive. So um, it's always nice to see participant faces. Please feel free to, to, to also turn on your camera, as I said, during the, the panel discussion bit. Um, you are also invited to join the conversation on Twitter. If you are a Twitter fan, um, I've listed there the hashtag uh, for the event. So um, feel free to, to use that. You should be able to see um, now on your screens our agenda for, for today. As I mentioned, um, we have a set of examples on, um, on approaches to community building coming from Freya, Shock, and EOS Cup. And um, following that, as I mentioned, we will have um, a, a, a panel discussion. But if you do have um, any burning questions, we will take some of those right after after each presentation. So our topic for today, as I as I said, um, will be will revolve around community building, and we will see a couple of uh, a couple of examples um, of effective. Uh, strategies for community building and hopefully um, things that can be taken forward in the future work on um, on EOSC. The examples we'll see today will be focused on training, knowledge exchange, awareness raising, adoption and onboarding. But there are obviously um, a lot of reasons why we take we dedicate so much effort to to community building. And sometimes these things are underestimated, such as good communication and clear language, coordination, strengthening best practices, sharing expertise and, um, and support. Um, the approaches obviously can be domain focused, inter multidisciplinary or cross cutting. So um, there are many sides to, to this conversation and we hope to bring, to bring forward some of, the, some of these, uh, these key points as we, as we go along. So um, 
these this is um, this are this is our objective this is our driver for the for the session today but we would be very interested to to learn a little bit um, about who's in in the audience and what has brought you what has brought you here today so um, if you would kindly go to mentimeter or menti.com and insert the code that we have there. So 59951493. Um, there are a couple of questions that are focused on um, learning a little bit about your role, um, discipline and domain expertise. And also um, a second question that is focused on your interest or what brought you here today. Um, I'll try to go out of full screen and move to the Menti meter. Okay. Um, so the code again is five nine nine five one four three. So we hope to build a nice uh, tag cloud to understand which are the disciplines um, that are being represented today. So I see digital humanities, uh, social sciences in terms of uh, disciplines, astronomy as well. Um, in terms of role, we have data stewards, we have training coordinators, data managers. Um, also, we have a couple of cross-cutting themes like interoperability, metadata. Um, we have the uh, researchers in the crowd as well and people working on fair data, open access. So this is um, this is quite an interesting crowd, but as you can see, the social sciences, for at least for the time being, dominates in terms of uh, in terms of the of the disciplines. Um, I see libraries as well, and very interesting international surveys. Um, we have commun uh, communication coordinators. Um, obviously, they are one of the drivers as well in terms of uh, in terms of community building. Um, people working on environmental data. So um, education as well, um, as seen differently from, from it's, it isn't necessarily training and e-infrastructures, open access program managers. So um, thank you very much for that. These insights are very useful also for, for our presenters. So they, um, they see who they are actually speaking to and um, who the message, who their messages are going to be um, sent out to. Okay, scholarly technology. So we have a nice, quite diverse crowd. Um, we have a second question that will probably take a little bit more time, but again, um, the topics related to to community building are quite or quite diverse. So we are interested in understanding um, if the people who have uh, who have joined uh, the session are interested um, in in the topic because they're building, I don't know, um, community or they're collaborating um, under a wider, a bigger, uh, broader exercise of community building, such as uh, well contributing to 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 the ask or if they're actually just interested to understand um, how they can improve their, um, their work inside their communities. So um, I see no, no particular entries. I'm hoping that the Mentimeter works or maybe, okay, thank you very much. So, um, we have a couple of answers, how to strengthen uh, communities of trainers, building training in, um, in the shock project. So that's very specific. Understanding how to improve communities, get informed on what's going on. So um, that's especially uh, very welcome. Out of just curiosity, that's also very good. Um, overview of cur current situation and plans. Um, let's see a little bit. Um, I'll press enter to stop the scrolling. Um, so there are um, also initiatives in building RDM and, uh, ambassadors, communities and programs, uh, collaboration opportunities and best practices. Um, there are people interested in, um, in getting new ideas in terms of uh, for training. Um, 
to exchange experiences, um, to avoid small scattered communities. So fragmentation obviously is, um, is, always, um, is always a problem because we do have discipline focused um, um, activities, uh, but there are many cross cutting themes and many work, uh, a lot of work that, uh, that we can do that we can do together and we should be aligned on that. So the fragmentation obviously is a very, is a very key point. Um, I think I missed, uh, yes. So there are many um, else related projects and it's important to learn how to collaborate. I, let's see if there are any other, any other points, getting an overview. Okay, um, I think we covered strategic strategies for community building. I think we have covered um, all our top uh, most of the most of the entries, and we can actually move on to to our our agenda for today. So thank you very much for the for the insights. I will stop sharing my screen and give the possibility to our first speaker to to share their screen. So Francis, you should be you should be able to to share your screen now. So we are going to start with uh, insights from uh, Francis Madden. She is the research identifiers uh, lead at the British Library. She has coordinated the Frey Ambassadors program and has been uh, leading the creation of training materials with, within Freya since uh, 2018. She will be talking to us about the Frey Ambassadors program. So Francis, take it over. Thank you. Thanks, Tanea. Um, can you all see my screen okay and hear me? Yes. We can see your screen and can hear you very well. Good to check first. Um, thank you everyone um, for um, joining us this morning. My, um, as Tamea said, my name is Frances Madden um, and I'm based at the British Library. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the um, Freya Ambassador Programme. And the Ambassador Programme is um, was a part of the communications work package within Freya and um, Freya was is a three year um, Horizon 2020 funded project about persistent identifiers. And what I mean by persistent identifiers just um, you've probably heard quite a lot about them um, over the course of this this conference, but um, what I mean by them is DOIs and ORCIDs. So we had an ambassador program and the aim of it was to um, have a bi-directional relationship with um, PID enthusiasts um, in across various domains. And the idea behind it was that we could engage with a wider community than would be possible for us to do just as the project team, that we could um, gather input into our services. Um, Freya operated a model of iterative engagement and so sort of repeated requirement gathering and reflection refinement and um, so the ambassadors provided a very useful community with which to engage from on that front. Um, we were also very determined that our developments would meet user needs so we were able to um, um, rely on the ambassadors to provide us with user stories and um, to inform our work and also in turn that they um, could amplify the project and the outputs that we produced. So um, I'm going to just give an overview about how the program worked and, um, and sort of what we learned from it. Um, Frey is coming to, the, to an end at the end of this month as well. So um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, so where did we find these ambassadors? So we had quite um, an active recruitment program. Um, Freya is the third um, sort of European persistent identifier project. And and um, the previous project Thor had had an ambassador program as part of it as well. So we were able to recruit um, some former Thor ambassadors as um, to, to be ambassadors for Freya as well. We also um, recruited actively at RDA plenaries and we advertised the program on our project website. And through that, we um, attracted quite a lot of um, 
of interest. Um, we also held annual competitions um, for the Frey ambassadors and the first two of those were definitely positioned as a method of, um, you know, as an incentive to join the program as well. And um, so the prize for that was to fund a place at Pitapalooza. So it was definitely a good way to attract people who were interested in persistent identifiers and gave them a, a good opportunity. Um, we asked them to sign a simple memorandum of understanding um, as part of signing up to be an ambassador. It wasn't, um, it didn't have um, sort of very strong requirements or anything um, associated with it, but it was um, just to make sure that the um, ambassadors were, um, you know, understood what was expected of them but we we did make it deliberately lightweight so that um you know because it is a voluntary contribution that people could um, give as much or as little time as they had available to them um we did decide to close um the program to new entries in march this year and um, we made that decision i suppose just before all of the um covid um disruption hit but um it was decided that we um that the sort of amount that people could contribute at this um, from March would be somewhat limited because you know it would just be from March to November. Um, but we um, were very happy with the, with the recruitment. We had you know eleven core ambassadors continued on, and then we had another eleven sign up in year in the first year of the project, ten in the second year, and then five in the third year as well, which was sort of you know a short year as well. Um, and the other thing that we were quite happy about was the ge geographical spread of the ambassadors. So you can see there that they're spread all around the world. Um, and they from 21 countries, you know, across all different continents. And we had um, 37 in total. So there's definitely a European focus there, um, as you can see. But equally, we are very happy that there was such a broad array of um, you know people from all around the world were interested in signing up to the program. Um, the other thing that we were we were happy about was the sort of a range of roles that um, the ambassadors um, worked in. Um, so across a range of career levels um, and also um, just in different um, sort of areas and domains, because of course, you know, persistent identifiers, they cut across um, so many different areas of the research landscape that we were very happy that we were able to get all these different perspectives. And um, when the, it, those of you who are very good at addition will see that the subject list here doesn't include um, all of the ambassadors, but we included sort of a subject breakdown for those where we could capture that. So um, it's particularly for researchers, but also people working in research infrastructures and stuff where there is a, a specific um, sort of subject area. Um, so then what did we do to support the ambassadors um, as members of, of the program? Well, we had a lot of um, interaction with them. Um, we had a program of webinars, um, which were a really good way to um, sort of give the ambassadors sort of early access to what we were doing within Freya and to tell them um, about all of our developments. We had a mailing list, which we used very actively um, to communicate with the ambassadors about various things that were going on in the project, events, things like that. Um, we also had a blog, which we, well, we the, like the Freya project had a blog, but we um, encouraged ambassadors to um, sort of use the blog as, a, as you know, an outlet for them to um, communicate about their work. And we had also had a Meet the Ambassadors blog series um, this year as well, where we had a few posts from the ambassadors sort of talking about their work kind of in quite a general way. Um, I've already mentioned the ambassador competition. This is a picture of one of our um, ambassador competition winners um, speaking at um, Pitapalooza in, in 2019. So we ran the competition in 2018, 2019, and then we also ran a third competition for um, to speak at this um, this this conference, in fact, and we had um, we heard from uh, we had two two winners for for the third competition, um, who we heard from the, over the last couple of days. Um, and yeah, I mean um, Nicole, who is speaking in whose picture is here, she was um, th this gave her a very good opportunity to communicate about her work um, in a way that she wouldn't have been able to in a community that she wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise. So um, moving on then to how the ambassadors supported 
us in the project so I've you know I'm, I talked about the plans that we had and um, they were definitely realized and um, some more besides um, so I mentioned user stories so this is just a snapshot of a Mentimeter that we had um, at one of the webinars and um, talking about the user stories that um, the ambassadors were able to contribute we also um, asked them to validate some of our outputs for example our training materials um, they were able to um, you know, offer opinions and refinements for, our for the training materials that we created. Um, there's a session about this, that this afternoon as well, which I'm um, be speaking at. So if you're interested in hearing more about that. Um, we also asked them to do um, sort of input into other services. For example, they were um, co contributed quite a lot to the requirements gathering for the data side common service, which was developed and um, was, there was um, a session about um, earlier this week. Um, one thing that we hadn't necessarily envisaged at the outset of the project, but which was really successful, was um, we asked the ambassadors to help us with translating resources into languages that weren't English. Um, this came out of a session at Pitapalooza about the um, PIT forum and the fact that um, there was some appetite for resources in in other languages and we so we asked the ambassadors to um, translate um, one of our topics that was about what um, why use persistence identifiers so quite a basic introductory resource um, but we received and um, they obliged by um, translating and um, we have um, now have that resource in Portuguese, Slovakian, Ukrainian, Arabic and so we're really happy with that and then we also created a video as part of the project and um, they also uh, provided translations of the subtitles for that as well. Um, so that was something that we, we were quite adaptive to what um, the project was doing um, and then sort of asking the ambassadors to contribute where they could and um, we were really happy to see that. Um, I need to speed up, but um, I just thought I'd mention at the, um, recently, um, as we were drawing towards the end of the, the programme, um, we decided to survey the ambassadors and they asked them, you know, why they decided to become, a, become ambassadors. And the two reasons were to stay up to date with the PIT community and to increase their knowledge of persistent identifiers. And those were also seen as being the major benefits of being an ambassador as well, um, the same reasons. Um, we were also very happy to see that um, we had a sort of 30% response rate about, so um, 11 contributed and um, to the survey and 10 out of the 11 felt that they'd received enough support and guidance, so we were happy to see that. Um, oh, oh, gosh, sorry. <laughs> um, the, um, just to close, um, I thought I'd draw attention to a few of the comments we had on the um, survey. Um, as well about things that were that could be improved um for example um you know the some of the ambassadors expressed a desire that they weren't um you know for more networking and um, discussion opportunities amongst the ambassadors we did try to facilitate that as best we could um but the uptake was was low um another thing that came across was that um uh, some of the ambassadors felt that they hadn't had the time that they would have liked to contribute to the program um, as I mentioned, it was a voluntary contribution, so it's possibly not so surprising um, that, you know, because it was voluntary, you know, um, we, we were happy with the contribution that we received, but, um, you know, people always would like more time, I think. Um, another thing, because of the sort of really global reach of, of the programme, it could be quite difficult for people to attend webinars live, um, but we always try to record them um, so that people could watch them at a later date. Um, the last comment um, about, you know, it being good work and that it's a pity it's ending, we definitely echo that, um, but we did try to take steps to um, make sure that the ambassadors were sort of fully aware of everything that Freya had done throughout the project and the, um, we communicated the um, sort of key results that we'd had from the project um, to them recently um, and, you know, we'll do so up until the end of the project to make sure that um, you know, as it's a finite community that those um, those ambassadors have the, um, you know, have the full awareness of, of everything that, that happened within the program so that they're sort of, you know, fully equipped um, to go out into, um, to continue on um, sort of spreading the word about um, persistent identifiers. 
So I've spoken for a bit too long, so I apologize for that, but I will stop now and stop sharing and happy to take any questions if we've time. No, you, you are perfectly on time. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to add them to the chat. Or if you would like to to um, to unmute also to ask questions, that's that's perfectly that's perfectly good as well. Um, Ricarda has put in um, into the chat um, the link to the knowledge hub and training session that is uh, this afternoon, the session that Francis mentioned earlier. So if you are interested, um, you can join that as well. Okay, um, I see there are no questions, so I think we can move on. Thank you very much, Francis. So our next speaker is Ellen Leinart. I hope I'm pronouncing well the, the name. She is a project lead at Dance and has been involved in training activities for CESDA and other European projects such as Open Air, ELSK Synergy and Shock, Shock and she has experience um, in training for research data management. She will be uh, talking to us about uh, the shock training community. So um, thank you, Ellen. Hi, thank you. I will first uh, start sharing my screen. Um, let's see if that works. Yes, we can see your slides in full screen. Very good. Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you for um, uh, having this opportunity. I think it's very nice to, to tell you about the training community um, from shock. Um, but um, I, I have to admit that we are doing the work uh, as a team, task team. It's only a small task within a larger work package, task 6.4, but it has also a lot to do with other tasks in that work package. So, um, and uh, I would also like to mention that Tatiana Janklewicz and Ricardo Bragman are also involved, uh, heavily involved in this task. So the context of the training community, the training community work, the building of the training community that we're doing is uh, work packet six. There's a link there on the slide. We are organizing, uh, work packet six is organizing training workshops and webinars on all kinds of topics. Uh, we organize also train the trainer uh, boot camps that is part of our 6.4 task. And we had one at the Libre conference on Claren tools and didactics. Uh, in June, which was online, of course, and we will have another one. We are organizing currently another one uh, for February, uh, together with Daria and the Working Group on Research Data Management on didactics and uh, RDM as well. Um, then uh, also part of 6.4 is the Training Discovery Toolkit, uh, also uh, aiming to support the trainers, uh, that are active within EOSC on uh, the social sciences and humanities and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to create an inventory of train the trainer resources and we are closely collaborating uh, with the shock marketplace that you might have heard of already this week and uh, to ensure interoperability and sustainability but it's a, a test case is if it is useful or not I will tell a bit more in the next slide because this training discovery toolkit is, <clears throat> um, if you if you um, go there, it starts with a starting page, and then you can. It's really strong on searching uh, resources, um, and all kinds of resources can be find found that are mainly uh, aiming at reuse by trainers. And we are going to look. I mean, shock is not ending this month. It will be, uh, continue for another year at least. So we will uh, uh, update this and make it more, um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, make it, uh, see how it can be become more useful and how it can be integrated better in the marketplace if that's a need for the trainers and how to move forward with it once that the project is over. Um, so the, the training community is a community of trainers that we set up and launched in June last year. 
uh, in 2019, and we immediately had around 20 members, which is mainly, of course, the task team and um, a few more uh, of, of, the, of the conference at that time. But in September, we already had 70 members. Now we had a, a, a now in around March, we had 120 members, and in uh, currently we have more than 150 members. So these members are have um, how do you say that have registered on the on the on the shock website to wanting to become a, a part of the training community. And as you can see, it's not only uh, European uh, Europeans who would like to join and would are eager to. Uh, share experiences with other trainers, but also um, outside Europe. So uh, it's a bit similar to the to the image that uh, Francis was showing. So we also have uh, contributors from Australia, but also Brazil and other countries. Now, in respect of disciplines, <coughs> I've added this full image because I thought I cannot, uh, 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 it was not easy to group them <laughs> somehow, but anyway, so you see that, um, and also uh, there's also, also a lot of, of, of uh, critics when you do group, so uh, that's why I didn't do it as well. So we have a lot of sociologists, um, uh, linguistics uh, is, is well pre presented, I think that's because of the Libre conference, and we also, and the Claren tools that we showed, uh, psychology is well presented, um, communications, and education, which is, I think, uh, quite logic. Now, I said a bit about it already, but the activities of the training community, the goal is uh, to exchange uh, good practices and uh, news experiences and learn from each other or collaborate with each other uh, um, to organize joint events. And we, to achieve that, we have a mailing list that um, um, we don't have a Slack community, but we do have a mailing list, which is not very active, but we are very active with monthly calls. So these uh, we organize monthly uh, since March. And uh, the topics that you see listed here were topics that the members of the training community uh, proposed and also uh, speakers where, you know, uh, when, when we asked when you would you like to share your experience with improving your online training and how did you do that so far? Then uh, uh, some of the members uh, said, well, uh, I would like to talk about that and the same for the other subjects. So that's also why uh, we had a very nice <coughs> call on uh, gaming, on open science training. And um, we do a bit of networking as well during those calls because people would like to know what other others are involved in and um, can better connect with each other. Now, after, uh, I, I think that we were asked also to evaluate a bit how uh, uh, did it go so far. So I think uh, that's at least what worked well. And um, like uh, I mentioned, uh, as the first thing was that many people signed up for it. So. A lot of people, a lot of trainers like the idea of having a training community. Uh, we have representatives from all disciplines. Um, we have the, I think we, we achieved the goal that uh, a lot of experiences are shared. A lot of ideas are shared around, for example, interactive training, how do you do this? Uh, it's a very inclusive community. We're open to anyone, not only social sciences and humanities. We have, uh, as I mentioned, the members that decide on the topics and so forth. What didn't work well, I think, is that although we have now 150 members uh, on our monthly calls, there's, well, if we have uh, uh, 20 attendees, it's a lot. So it's mainly 15, around 15, the numbers of, of participants. And uh, this is one of the things that we would like to increase, uh, um, to have more, because uh, the, I didn't mention that it, it's small, it's nice small groups for discussion. So that's really on topic. So that's working really well. Um, but um, I also, we also see that that there are different, there are some, there's a study group of a few people that come every two calls or something. And uh, every call, there are also a bunch of new people coming. 
that not necessarily turn up the next time, but maybe three three times later. So it would be nice if we have it, if more people would would join these and these calls. So I, I'm really interested in if you have ideas around that. Um, we thought we already um, achieved more. How do you say that more? Um, involvement by um, choosing topics for each call and making sure that um, every member, if he wants to, can present his own work, because I think that's also important sometimes. So ideas where if we could have our monthly calls uh, with other community uh, uh, events, but uh, yeah, if you have any ideas, please share. Um, then this is already uh, the last one, how to make the shock training community as a community of, 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 of trainers sustainable after the project is something that we already think about, of course. And um, there is um, what you will hear about um, today as well is the community of practice of training coordinators. And we, I think we should in the end join forces also because, because the subjects tend to be more generic than discipline specific. Uh, also in our in our uh, monthly calls, uh, of course, there's the ERDA Education uh, and Training of Research Data Group, and um, yeah. So how can we uh, assist um, the trainers uh, more? So uh, together with them, I mean. So the alignment uh, with the uh, EOSC Working Group Training and Skills and EOSC Fair Working Group, I think is also very relevant. The, these groups are ending, so we should see what they say on how to continue and uh, with regard to training. And I think in the end, we should try to seek funding for some interoperable training services that virtually everyone who trains uh, in Europe and outside would like to, to have to enable reuse and of training resources, but also um, knowledge exchange and ex uh, exchanging experiences and, and good practices in training. So if you have any other ideas to make it sustainable, please mention so. And this is already my last slide. So if you have any other questions about uh, the activities of the of the Shockware Packet 6 or uh, our task regarding boot camps and the training toolkit and the training community, please contact me and I either ask, answer myself or ask my colleagues. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I think the, the issue of, um, of the sustainability will, will come up also in the panel discussion, um, hopefully, so we would have a wider conversation about that. There is a very specific question for you um, in the chat. Um, Irena is asking, why would we have several communi uh, training communities? What are the advantages for having discipline specific communities and trainings? Yeah, well, uh, we started um, to think about this. Uh, we, uh, there was already the community of practice of, of training coordinators, which is not uh, aiming at trainers themselves, but at uh, coordinators. Um, and the RDA group, as it was global, and um, we thought it would be good to have something specific for social science and humanities. But as I mentioned, now that we have it, I think that there is not a lot of discussion among these monthly calls that are really social sciences or specific discipline specific. So I'm thinking now that it's it might be better to merge it with the uh, community of practice of training coordinators. But um, so uh, originally the community of practice was really for training coordinators within the large uh, uh, European projects and. Um, but it could be a sub subgroup there uh, of trainers um, or any other location. But but the reason was that we thought, uh, uh, seeing the discussion that the community of practice, we thought that would be uh, it would be good to have room for uh, discipline specific discussions on specific training around, uh, uh, for example, clearing tools or 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 any other subject. 
So, but okay. at the moment, it doesn't seem to be happening that much, but maybe that will change because we only had six monthly calls yet, so. Okay, um, we have another question from Gergay and then we can actually move on to the to the to the next presentation. So um, he's asking if the trainers are specific to to EOSC. Do they train specifically about the about the EOSC? Well, if if Gergay is referring to uh, services uh, that are uh, EOSC specific, no. Um, but there are a lot of open science uh, trainers, um, for example, um, and um, a lot of RDM that are, that are that is covering more disciplines and also, yeah, using services that are offered within EOS. So. Okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, Veronica has also added a, a link uh, where you can where you can register for the social sciences and humanities training community. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'll pick up uh, your point, Irina, about uh, the discipline specific and the uh, collaboration across disciplines in the panel discussion. If that's uh, if that's okay. Um, so just so we can move on to to our next presentation. Which is actually coming from uh, from Irina and uh, and Rene. They are going to talk to us about the community of practice for training coordinators. Um, Irina, I'm, I'm sure many of you of you know her um, and know Rene as well. Um, Irina is uh, is the EIFL um, Open Access Program Manager, and she's one of the coordinators of the Open Air Communities of Practice for Training Coordinators. She coordinates the open air training activities and is a rapporteur for the EOSC Skills and Training Working Group. Rene is a project manager at, uh, at Dance. Um, he's an expert in, um, in the field of research data management and has been involved for a long time in projects such as Freya, EOS Cup, Shock, Fair's Fair, um, and in this session, he'll talk to us about uh, the communities of practice for training coordinators. So um, I think Rene is, uh, is gonna be sharing his screen. Yeah, you've moved actually to the last. Yeah. There you go. Very good. We can see your, uh, your slides and can hear you. Thank Starting you. With, the last, with the last slide is really not a good uh, training practice now. Um, yeah, thank you for this introduction, Timea. I'm going to have a short presentation, um, prepare it together with Irina, who is also in the meeting and um, also able to join the discussion later on. So um, what I would like to do is give some background information on the community of practice mentioned already a couple of times and also do some um, evaluation and, um, and, this, and, and bring up some discussion points. So the community of practice is an informal network to share training experiences and is aimed at training coordinators as already said by Alan. It's informal, so we don't have any um, strict rules or, uh, or regulations to join. It's a bottom-up initiative. Uh, it started um, after um, uh, the final EU DOT uh, conference. I will come back to that later, yeah. So we uh, share experience between EOS related initiatives and we try to in in initiate cross infrastructure training activities. And here you see the, uh, the URL of, the, um, of a web page where you can find the more information and also uh, information on who's member and how you can join. It's in the openair.eu domain, and that is also uh, the, and, um, uh, so um, they took the initiative to, to put, take this on. And it's really uh, all credits for this go to uh, Irina to organize that and um, yeah, and to be the uh, very strong um, motivator to get the group going on. So as I said, it was initiated at the final EUDOT project conference, which was early 2018. So, um, and then it took summer time before we got active in September. We are, so we are a little bit more than two years active. 
there were 67 online meetings. I know that because we have a, an, a, a rolling minutes document and that uh, where you can find all the, um, the minutes of the meetings we had. And uh, it's, a, it's a 60, 70 pages document. And uh, going through this document also really, it's very interesting to see what kind of um, topics came up and how, what kind of uh, information was shared within the group. Our next meeting will be on December 8th, two o'clock, and then we will discuss um, a strategy for the future. So everybody's welcome to join. We have a mailing list and a Slack channel. And, uh, but most of the communication goes um, in, uh, in, in virtual meetings and also at face-to-face uh, -face meetings. I will come back to that uh, later. So currently the, the community of practice of research coordinators has uh, 67 um, uh, members. And, um, uh, and here you see an overview of the EOS related projects and initiatives that uh, these people represent. That, that's a lot, it's, it's quite um, uh, broad, but I also miss a couple of uh, projects. And um, so um, we, are not, uh, we are not covering the whole uh, landscape, but quite a lot, as you see. Um, here, this slide gives you an impression of uh, four face-to-face -face meetings we were involved. And I have to say, of course, uh, it's not a, the complete 67 people, uh, uh, but it's a, a subgroup of it. And that's not, and that's uh, depending on the meeting and uh, uh, who's there and joins. But all the preparation is discussed in the already mentioned uh, uh, online uh, meetings we have. The first one was uh, in 2018, the dig digital uh, the DI for R. There was a uh, uh, a meeting, have your cup of tea in our cafe. I think this was more, um, uh, this was more a workshop where, where we exchanged experience and ideas on, um, on uh, training coordination. What we might have done also now if we, if we have a face to face, if we had a face to face meeting in Amsterdam. Um, the next one was uh, in, uh, the, in the open, uh, during the open science fair. There we had a, a, a session making EOS training more fair and um, organized by people from the community of practice. Um, representatives of our group were also active at the EOSC symposium 2019 and that had a close relationship with the EOSC working group on training and skills. Um, there was a breakout session on that. Another, the last um, uh, event I would like to mention was um, early this year, a really face-to-face -face meeting. It was possible at that time in February, a workshop on training in the EOSC, uh, re really uh, uh, represented by uh, quite a lot of um, uh, EOSC-related initiatives. The report is also ready and published. Um, so. Um, uh, that is uh, that is uh, four examples of um, of events that were uh, are related to the community of practice. Um, recently, we also organized a webinar and breakout sessions on a topic that uh, pops up uh, now and then. What are we allowed to do uh, with respect to the GDPR? Uh, with, when we do a training, what, what, how can we? create not a good uh, legal informed consent um, regulations. Um, these questions popped up. So, so we organized a, a webinar <clears throat> with breakout sessions that uh, covered things we had to do before the event, during and after the event. And it was very not, very good uh, meeting, I think. Um, and um, um, if you would like to um, have more information on it, you can find uh, via this web URL, this web address, you you find um, a report and um, and other uh, um, interesting links. So that's um, that's on the the past, the, the last the, 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 the last two years. Now something on um, yeah, question: What did work well? Some some evaluation. We did a survey um, recently and. Um, well, of these, uh, uh, of all the members, about 20 people, well, actually 21 people reacted. 
uh, about uh, 30 percent and uh, luckily 90 percent of these people are still happy with the activities and uh, nobody dares to say no but um, um, that, that is um, that 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 does it at least an indication um, we should not stop uh, right away well, the next uh, 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 figure shows us that um, yeah, that a lot of people only not 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 many people do come often or all the times. That's also already uh, mentioned by Ellen. People come up um, sometimes they only yeah now and then um, uh, they they join the meeting and um, and only twenty percent came more than nine times more than. And uh, well, is this a problem? Well, that is an indication that uh, that the group is uh, is fluid. And um, yeah, we are going to discuss uh, this internally later in in the, in the December meeting. Uh, we also uh, asked um, what uh, what do you uh, find most um, uh, useful? And um, uh, and there you see that people are mostly interested in exchange news on training activities. And suggestions on uh, and training and uh, and, uh, and skills, um, and um, yeah, so they the really practical information and, and 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 exchange of ideas is the is the is the is is, uh, is um, the, uh, of most benefit by the people that filled in the survey, and. Um, we also, um, yeah, this, I'm sorry, this is a lot of text, but um, this is of course important. We also, we also asked the people to, um, oh, wait a minute, uh, to what they would like to change. And then uh, you see that, uh, that, um, that uh, this text is just in front, yeah, that each uh, uh, participant represented would be great to, to, to have more participation as a topic. Rotating chairmanship, yeah, that's uh, uh, currently uh, um, yeah, a small group of people uh, does, uh, is, is most active in the group uh, and uh, Irina is, 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 is really uh, uh, yeah, important in this. Uh, invite new people, find synergies and avoid overlap. So well, let's talk also with, uh, with the shock training community bigger role in reviewing and validating work done in EOS projects, we create an online forum, more structure. Well, yeah, that's to, to, to have it informal and bottom up is, uh, uh, of course, that means that it's not very structured, but we have to think about doing that maybe more. Um, um, also organize a presentation every call. Um, it is um, uh, a bit more direction and focus. Uh, we should formulate a mission statement and specific objectives. And that is really something we think is, uh, is something we should do and make more noise. Well, I'm doing that now. Um, um, well, there's also people that say we I'm reluctant to, uh, to suggest changing. Um, a list of relevant topics and uh, topics and then publish them in advance so people know when there is something that they are interested in. More opportunities for networking and um, uh, focus on comprehensive topics and exploring them. So these are, um, 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 uh, the, the, this slide represents what came out of this consultation. We also asked them, uh, have you concrete suggestions? Uh, but uh, and given the time now, and this is not a common use practice meeting. I just wanted to share some thoughts that came out of the group as an evaluation um, uh, of the community of practice. And now I go to, uh, yeah. So my question then to you is, what are your suggestions for the community of practice? And again, um, uh, that would be, uh, might be uh, something to discuss um, uh, during this meeting or at least start a discussion. So, um, yeah, so I hope I gave you an overview of what the community of practice is, where it came from, what activities we did, and, uh, and, and, and what the state is, and how we are currently evaluating it. And, um, yeah, so that is what I wanted to say. And, um, yes. yeah, that's in time, eh? yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Rene. Irina, is there anything that you, that you would like to, to add to that? I know oh. that you. Go ahead. Thanks a lot. So, 
looking forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you both. Um, so there's been uh, quite a bit of an ex uh, an exchange in the in the chat, um, and it's all related to the to the discipline focused and agnostic approaches. So we're going to pick that up in the in the panel discussion. But I think we can move on to our um, next and final presentation. So um, this comes uh, from Gergely Shiposh. Uh, community building with the EOSC uh, portal. So Gergely is head of services, solutions and support at the EGI Foundation, which a lot of you know is uh, the Coordination Institute for the EGI Infrastructure. Gergely has been involved in EOSC since EOSC pilot and since 2019 he coordinates the stakeholder engagement in, ELSC Hub, in the EOS Cup project. He's also involved in the setup of the EOS portal, the EOS provider onboarding process, and he's also a member of the group that handles user service access requests from the, from the EOS portal. So we can already see your slides. Gergely, please feel free to take it over. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So let me show these few slides about the experience with building community through the EOS portal. So it's a slightly different approach, I think, compared to the previous presentations, because what we will put in the focus is a technical tool, the EOS portal, that we use to onboard services and onboard users to, to use those services. The presentation that I'm giving you is very much based on a publication that we put into Zenodo in June, which is basically the evaluation of the EOSC hub engagement activity, covering all sorts of engagement instruments and all sorts of forms of engagement, which you can see on the right side, right side of this slide, uh, competence centers, thematic services, the services that are onboarded in the EOSC portal from providers, the user requests that are served, uh, the so-called early adopter program and the event participation and event organization. Um, this publication has received, I think, quite a, quite a good number of, of views and downloads since June. So it's clearly is an interesting topic. And I think we are, as EOSC Hub, in the best position to provide you the data about how successful the EOSC portal is so far. And this presentation is focusing exactly on that part. So out of this publication, I will zoom into the service onboarding request that we serve through the portal and the service user request, which we serve through the portal. You can see the bare numbers here, which I will explain you uh, soon. So let's, let's start with what the EOS portal is. You probably know that it has been launched two years ago, almost exactly today, two years ago. So happy second anniversary. And this is the landing page for the users, providers, and various other stakeholders who want to engage with EOSC. And from the point of view of this presentation, there are two important aspects of the portal. One is that it enables service providers to onboard their services. Since November, 2018, we onboarded more than 250 services and eventually only 90 or so of those came through the portal because there was a large number of services that have been already onboarded by the Infra Central catalog or other catalogs that we kind of imported into the portal backend straight away. But there are 90 users or 90 providers who came in through this four provider section and registered their service. And the second aspect of the portal is that the services can be accessed by users and we can monitor that. And because of the nature of the services, we can monitor that access in two ways. One is that some of the services that are open access services do not require authentication or login or any kind of tracking of the users. For those services, we can only observe the visits on the service landing pages. For those services that require login and authentication, we have a much more visibility or visible monitoring. In those services, the access request must be submitted by the users. That's those service requests uh, are 
evaluated by the providers. So we have a much stricter and more kind of realistic number of the actual use. <clears throat> so in, in the next slides, let me zoom into some statistics and breakdown of those. So if, if we, first we focus on the provider, so you can see 250 services have been onboarded and 90 through the website. So let's, let me break down that number. Uh, you can see on this first pie chart, the, the, the geographical coverage of the providers who so far onboarded services into EOSC through the portal. You can see that uh, roughly one quarter of those are from multinational providers. These are typically mapped, mapped to H2020 projects who onboard services. Not a quarter or even more than a quarter is from large scale, even bigger international consortium. Very often we map the S3 or other European research infrastructures to that. The third large group are national providers. I think there is an increase or we expect an increase here in the coming years as national EOSC initiative are, are established. And the last are global providers who are typically mapped to international companies. The second breakdown that I want to show you is the scientific discipline distribution of those providers, where they are coming from in terms of the disciplines. Uh, for this analysis, we use the Frescati schema, which um, has some benefits. It's used quite broadly in, in scientific publications, in, in journal classification and things like that. It also has some broad drawbacks. For example, one drawback can be immediately seen on this pie chart is that natural sciences, it's a huge area in this Frascati schema. Um, that's why you can see that nearly half of all the onboarded services come from natural sciences in some sense. The other big part you can see here is engineering and technology. The reason of that is that uh, many of the providers who have been onboarded come from generic IT provider organization, providing things like infrastructure as a service clouds or storage services. And those fall in this disciplinary classification under engineering and technology. And because EOSC is very much dominated so far by infrastructures, that's why we see a large segment of such providers in the onboarded pie chart. Because of this uh, dominance of natural sciences, we decided to go one level deeper in the, into the classification and zoom into the natural sciences. So on the second pie chart below, I break down the natural sciences providers. And here, there is an interesting fact here that earth and related environmental sciences dominate quite strongly. Even if we consider this, putting it back, that it's like 60% of this blue segment, then it's still a huge uh, area. So one, one kind of observation is that the earth sciences and the environmental sciences are taking up the EOSC portal quite strongly and register services. Um, the rest I don't think is surprising. Biological sciences and physical sciences dominate chemical and other kind of computational related uh, sciences um, fall a, a bit behind. So let's move on to the, to the analysis of users. So these users I mentioned can have, uh, on one hand can be just visitors. So monitoring the visitors, I think it's important because as I said earlier, many of the services do not track really the usage because they are fully open access. The only estimate on the usage can be concluded from the visitors. And we know that it's not an exact mapping. We know that not every visitor becomes a user, but we have some indication of the, uh, from this traffic. Here on this diagram, you can see two types of visitors. One is that the visitors on the EOS portal, which is the main landing page. And the second is the backend part, which is the marketplace. 
if somebody is interested in a specific service, then it has to go through the marketplace. You can see here that roughly one out of six visitors on the EOS portal goes further to the marketplace and visits a particular service entry. Uh, that's an indication of, of the interest in the services or an indication of how many of the EOS portal visitors are actually have the intention of some usage of the services. So it's one sixth of the overall visitors are somehow interested in usage. The other uh, segment are clearly just there to learn about EOS, for example, or to learn about some projects or about the background uh, motivations and initiatives that drive EOS further. And some services, as I said, require access requests. Those services are working with limited capacity typically, and therefore the providers need to evaluate every single access request one by one, deciding whether or not to allocate the capacity or allocate uh, that service to that particular user. For these services, we have a much stronger uh, traffic uh, monitoring because we can see the number of access requests that have been submitted. And on the second pie chart, you can see this access request distribution per month until the end of June, which was when this publication was uh, put in Zenodo. And there is no clear trend. That's the first conclusion here. The second is there are some strange behaviors. The first is a huge spike here, which actually resulted because of a single kind of confused user who submitted a tremendous number of access requests without the real intention of using those services. So it took a bit of time until we clarified that with the user. The second is a kind of peak here across several months. And that's due to the early adopter program that the EOSC Hub project started, where we invited new adopter communities to come forward and request services. And that call eventually generated quite significant traffic in the EOSC portal with, the, with those pilots requesting access to certain uh, services. Let me go a bit further with these orders. Uh, these 331 orders, where we have kind of full understanding of, of, of the order, of the nature of the order. What we also analyzed is what is the original country of the user where the order come from? And here on this table on the left side, you can see that the breakdown per country the number of orders that came in from those countries and how many are the actual users who submitted those orders. You can see that in some cases, a single user submitted two orders. In some other cases, there are two individual users submitting the two individual requests separately. Uh, what we can observe from here is that obviously Europe dominates, but there are other uh, sources, for example, from Korea, where now I kind of uh, show this, this was the confused user who submitted a large number of requests. Um, Germany is high, not surprising. Uh, so it's kind of feeling the number of orders proportional to the size of the country. But we were really interested to see, is this true? is the number of orders really proportional to the size of the countries? So we did another analysis and we basically normalized these numbers by the population of each European country. We use Wikipedia as a source to say, was the population of each country in Europe? We did this exercise only to the European countries. And in the first column, you can see was the population of that country. In the last column, you can see uh, what, sorry, in the second column, you can see the number of orders that we received from those countries. And in the last column, you can see a normalized value. This normalized value is basically how many orders we should expect, assuming the average order to be proportional to 4.2 million 
inhabitant. And we got the 4.2 million by dividing the total number of European orders by the total population of Europe. So we normalize the data uh, using the European population. And based on that, we calculated what could be the average um, number of orders for each country, considering the country size. And here you can see the color coding that green is the countries that are kind of providing so far more orders than their size justified. And red means that the countries provided less orders than their uh, size would justify. So it's just an indication, a very clear and very simple indication of which countries are kind of lagging behind compared to the European average and which countries are uh, doing better than the European average. Okay. <clears throat> and the other aspect of the orders is what are actually the top demanded services, what people so far requested to access in EOSC. And here I just listed you the top 10 orders that we, the low, top 10 demanded services that have been requested. You can see the list here. And I provided some simple explanation of those services for you. The conclusion here is that all of these top 10 services are generic capabilities. Also, it's not a big surprise because clearly a generic service is relevant for more than one discipline. Meanwhile, uh, disciplinary services are specific to a segment of the potential market. But it's interesting to see that infrastructure as a service cloud is hitting quite high. Machine learning, which is again, a usage of the infrastructure as a service cloud is hitting high. Interactive data analysis in the cloud is hitting high. So those are the capabilities that are request a top and then different types of storage come afterwards. Uh, and this last analysis that I provide you with is that the distribution of orders across services. So you can see that a large segment of the registered services didn't receive orders. That's fine because actually there are many services that shouldn't even require orders. However, there are some uh, you, you can see a kind of healthy distribution, I would say, that th there is a long tail of services which receive a high number of orders, and then there is the, the large number of services which receive less and less orders as we go ahead. So let, let me conclude a few points here. That um, one is what worked well, what didn't work well. So by comparing these numbers with the KPIs that we set for EOS Hub, uh, we are doing fine. We estimated the number of access requests lower than that. However, we did that estimation for only the EOSC hub related services. When EOSC hub started, the EOSC portal wasn't planned. It's not in the work plan. This has been added later on. So we don't have properly KPIs defined for the success of the EOSC portal. This is something that I think one of the working group is doing or EOSC association will do to define KPIs for EOSC. Uh, so whether we are successful with these numbers or not is still to be discussed and defined. For the service onboarding aspect, um, we have a clear demand that the full catalog onboarding should be in place, enabling initiatives or national EOSC stakeholders to onboard the full catalogs of services in one go. That feature is in, in, the, in the production pipeline. And there was a session on, on two days ago about that. About the user access request, the main point that, and the main conclusion I would like to make is that we see that many of the user requests are not just, yeah, I need that service and just give me that service and I will use it. Most of the users need some consultancy. EOSC is not just an Amazon website where I know what I buy. EOSC is a catalog of much more complicated products and therefore consultancy and support is needed. Very often is needed even to choose the right product from the EOSC portfolio. And then consultancy is needed after the choice to do the real uptake and the real use. So consultancy should be strengthened and the currently lacking feature is integrated support across the different projects 
including Shock, including Freya and others. We don't have clear contact points in those projects who are contributing to the support of service orders in the EOSC portal. And the last steps for EOSC Hub is to, we sent already this analytics, this data to the different regional and thematic projects and clusters. So let's see what they do with this data. Will they strengthen their onboarding? Will they strengthen the use of those disciplines? We will see early 2021 when we will do the next iteration of this analysis. We launched a webinar program in order to promote the portal, the tools for onboarding new services, the tools to handle access requests once you onboarded your service. This webinar program is quite successful. There are still a couple of more events to go before the end of this year. So I, I suggest you also to take a look at the upcoming webinars. And then as the last step for EOS Hub will be to, to hand over all of this, uh, the portal, as well as the backend processes and teams, as well as this approach for the analysis to the EOSC Association, to the EOSC Enhanced Project and to the EOSC Future Project uh, around February or March when EOS Hub will close down. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gergé, for, for, those, for those insights and very interesting figures. Um, I think we can, um, I'll ask all the other speakers as well to, to turn on their cameras. We're gonna have um, a roughly 15 minutes of, uh, of panel discussion. Um, there are quite a set of questions for you, Gergé. Um, Related to some of the figures that you that you have uh, that you have presented, and it's um, it relates to to choosing the the population of a country as a reference for. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I'm reading that. So the reason why we chose the population is because we have data about that. We don't have data about the number of researchers per country, but if you have. Yeah. We are happy to use that number for the normalization next time. Yeah, Luke, I think is suggesting the country research and development uh, budgets or purchasing power parity index. I must, I must admit, I don't know much about the second one. Luke, do would you like to add any anything to that? Feel free to turn on your camera and microphone. Yeah, so there are multiple purchasing power parity indices. One of it, one of them is realized by the World Bank. Um, it, it, it's not ideal though, because it's purchasing power for the general population for, you know, um, it's, it's not scientific or R&D based in any way, but um, might be better um, than the general population. It also means, because that question comes up pretty often that that might be something we need globally, not only for EOS, but some way to normalize the I don't know, R&D power of some countries, just a thought. Yeah, um, and I think, thank you very much for that. Um, Gergé, would you like to? Yeah, that's, yeah that, that could be another way to do this. We, we can look at this in early next year when we do the next and final evaluation of the data. Uh, and that links to also Johannes's point that the st yeah. statistical significance, yeah, we don't have too many orders. I, I agree to, to be as significant, but we wanted to do this exercise just to, just to, just to see where we are now. Uh, and as I said, this was based until the number of orders we received until the end of May. So almost another year will be added by next March when we will do the next iteration. Mark is also suggesting the total number of researchers as it is um, referenced in many EOSC related documents. So, um, right. I hope but, this but, but, but I saw the 1.7 million for the Europe. I didn't see a breakdown per country. So it's, yeah. Uh, so I, that, I, that might I, be I a agree point. to this. But this number is, it should be somewhere available, uh, but it is not the number of references in yeah. the documents. Yeah. So we, we will spend more time on, on looking into this uh, in the next iteration. Okay. Um, 
we hope that these are very useful useful suggestions going going forward um you've already outlined actually in your in your final slides and i i thought that would that would be um um a very interesting thing to to maybe take away from uh, from the session the fact that there needs to be an, a more integrated approach across all the all the projects and there seems to be uh, quite um, quite a will also from the from the project side um, you've also outlined a couple of uh, differences in the disciplines which might take us back to um, the uptake based on the disciplines, uh, so my, which might take us back to the conversation about the about the um, whether there is a need for for um, a single sort of unified approach um, uh, that is um, that is domain agnostic, or do we need to be very very careful about the, acknowledging the domain uh, specific needs? Um, there was a nice conversation in the in the chat. Alan, I don't know if you if you would like to add anything to to that. Um, no, I think um, about the type of services that was clear in the later slide. So, uh, um, uh, but the thing I was yeah I was thinking if if it has something to do that. Uh, the numbers are biased also because services are used by some conferences, uh, some some countries through the EOSC portal, and others or or used it already before there was even a use uh, a portal. Um, and what do you expect? Where did you expect to have high numbers in uh, not based on the population, but maybe the type of services that are offered? So would you expect to have more uh, orders coming from, um, I don't know, uh, Eastern Europe or Southern Europe or Western Europe? Is there, is there, was there any idea about that? Um, I don't know. I, my expectation that it should be proportional to the number of researchers. So my, my gut feeling is that the number of researchers would be the ideal data to use per country but we just couldn't find that. Um, but it's, it, it, but okay. it's, it's maybe, maybe, maybe not true because in, in, in the, maybe in, in some, let's say richer countries, they just use local services, not through EOSC, but through other channels. And maybe in the, let's say the, 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 the poorer countries, they rather access services through the EOSC because there are, no sufficient local service. That's so I don't know. The, the, true, I, I think that the overall feeling of is that from this kind of data, we can pull out lots of interesting observations. Um, and we, we produce the data. Maybe we should make the data available and let everybody just play around with it and, and interpret it in a way that they would like to. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned that you already are sharing this analysis uh, across the across the different projects. So that's very right, useful right. useful information. I would assume also that's useful information for the train the trainer programs because then uh, people can um, can actually tell and um, well set up their training programs to be focused on uh, the services that are mostly mostly used and maybe also give the visibility to the discipline specific services that are maybe less used but um, mm -hmm. since the connections are discipline focused maybe that might be a way going forward mm -hmm. right but I, I hope that the EOSC Association will use some similar firm data to plan activities. Right. So this data that I presented are all available in the Zenodo document, which was on the first slide. Or if you go to Zenodo and search for EOSC evaluation of community, you will find it. So you, you, you get the raw numbers there if you wish.
as well as the pie charts and the other diagrams. That's very useful. We're going to share that that link as well um, in the in the chat again. I know you have it on your on your slide, so that's very useful. Um, then let's just follow up on that on that on your um, final observation that there needs to be a more integrated approach across the projects. Um, I'm wondering. Um, I would ask the other speakers and also the people that are that are present uh, with us. Uh, what would be a recommendation to? What would be a good solution to ensure that there is a better integration across the across the project? Because at the end of the day, we're at a session where we're discussing realizing um, the ask. So um, I'm curious about the insights. Um, one comment I'd make is that I know it was on a specific area, but I found the community of practice for training coordinators very useful for finding out information about other projects. And I think without that, there would have been a lot less join up across projects. I think it, it really did meet a need. Um, certainly from my perspective, I think it could have gotten quite but, with the sort of very specific remit of Freya focusing on persistent identifiers, I think there could have been, um, it could have got siloed quite easily. So that provided a very nice outlet to sort of join up with others. Yeah, what I'm thinking with the um, shock training community, I think we should look at if we can um, create some trainer training materials or see what trainer trainer materials are available for using social science and humanity specific services that are now already in the EOS portal. I think we didn't look at it uh, recently and um, um, seeing Gergely's presentation, I thought, oh dear, we should have. And um, so I think that's one of the goals that I, I take from this session. And I guess current challenges are that there are more and more initiatives of this kind, and it was easier to coordinate uh, two years ago when we started, and uh, it's more difficult now because uh, almost every country, all big institutions are also involved uh, in these activities. Uh, and to me, um, there is this question, how do you make sure that you create an engaging environment where everyone can really participate and uh, get the most out of it? Uh, and since we all moved online, then you know, maybe we should start using some kind of new new tools to make these interactions more efficient. Because uh, looks like we have spaces for collaborations. We have different initiatives where trainers could work together, but uh, we still see a need and how can we fulfill this need in a sustainable way in an environment where the demand is growing. Yes, um, you've pointed out very well an issue, the issue of the fragmentation, which has already come up um, and it's fragmentation across the various initiatives um, across also at national Borders. So um, it is challenging, but as you say, there is space for, for collaboration. Um, Veronica, um, but I actually I actually think that Ellen, you've answered this question, but I'm um, I'm happy if we if we look at it again. So are there um, any plans to integrate the shock marketplace and training discovery toolkit in the EOS Cup? For example, for um, stakeholders from the social sciences and humanities. So you you did say that you're going to look into this, but um, I don't know if you want to provide any more additional details. Well, I think it's uh, it's not EOSC Hub because EOSC Hub is ending. But uh, uh, if, when it, it's meant that the shock market marketplaces in the um, ESC portal, then uh, I think that's, but it's it's a overall goal, I think, from the shock project to prepare for EOSC and, and to make sure that it's integrated in EOSC services platforms. So yes. 
Okay. Um, thank you for that. A uh, couple of notes of appreciation for the for the discipline specific um, exchange versus agnostic uh, approaches. So thank you for that. Um, anyone else well, would like to ask any question or anything else to, to be added? Okay, I see no additional questions, but um, you, you do have the contact for, for, for our speakers and um, also for the initiatives that they represent. So um, with this, I'd like to thank you very much for taking part in the session and thank our speakers um, and thank also to the audience who has so actively contributed to the, to the discussion in the chat. And um, I wish you have a, a pleasant continuation of the day with, uh, with the event. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot, Timea and everyone. Bye. Bye.